Welcome to the Rochester, New Hampshire History Podcast, a monthly show that will shine a light on a piece of history that has been all but forgotten. On June 6, 1944, newspapers reported that the Allied invasion of Normandy, France, had commenced, also known as D-Day. It was the largest seaborne invasion in history. The invasion was made up of over 5,300 Allied ships and landing craft embarking almost 175,000 men onto five beaches. Most of the beaches were well fortified, with 50,000 Germans prepared for the invasion. In addition, the beaches were filled with landmines, machine gun nests, bunkers, and trenches. The invasion was a remarkable victory that came at a price of over 10,000 Allied casualties. Fred Hall of Rochester disembarked from a landing craft onto Omaha Beach that day and was an eyewitness to history. Of the five beaches, the most brutal fighting took place on Omaha Beach. There were 2,500 casualties at Omaha, with over a thousand killed, most within the first hour of the landings. Fred's first-hand account is a vivid description of the battle. The following are excerpts from Fred's memoirs of D-Day. As we approached the shore, we came under small arms and artillery or mortar fire. Troops were visible on the shore behind the riprap. Our landing craft finally dropped its ramp and we unloaded into shallow water. We landed short of the beach obstacles in plain view. It was every man for himself where we were under intense fire. Captain Dodd was killed by the time we reached the first line of obstacles. Of the 28 men aboard my landing craft, 14 reached the riprap. The beach was in a state of confusion. We had landed at a point east of our designated landing area. We were under small arms, artillery, and mortar fire. It was apparent the naval and air bombardment proceeding had had little effect. Once ashore, it was a matter of survival, but I was busy trying to round up unit commanders to organize their men to move along and eventually off the beach. There was not much time to think except to do what had to be done. The medics were helping the wounded. Some soldiers' weapons were jammed in the sand and they were trying to clean them. There was not time to worry about the dead. Someone reported that John Matthews, our executive officer, had been killed by a sniper. In the meantime, as the tide rapidly came in, other units were landing. I could see the tide had reached the beach obstacles and landing craft were letting people off into deeper water. As the beach narrowed from the incoming tide, it became very crowded and the confusion increased. Soldiers were having a difficult time trying to wade ashore burdened with their equipment while being subjected to enemy fire. There was no movement off the beaches. Some of the boats were taking direct hits. I watched one coming in with troops unloading on ramps down each side. The ramps were raked with small arms fire as the soldiers came down. There were many casualties. It was pretty bad. One or two Navy destroyers came in close to the beach and placed direct fire on the pillboxes and other targets which helped suppress the direct fire on the beach. And the noise, always the noise, naval gunfire, small arms, artillery, mortar fire, aircraft overhead, engine noises, shouting, and the cries of the wounded. No wonder some people could not handle it. In retrospect, I believe that the 2nd Battalion had landed in its assigned areas, we might have had an easier time getting off the beach, as this is where the initial breach was made. As it was, we landed directly in front of a very heavily fortified pillbox. After a couple hours, word came down that a squad from Company E had breached the minefield and had reached the top of the bluff. Behind the riprap was a rather low, open area, perhaps 50 yards wide, which was heavily mined with anti-personnel mines. I, with other members of the advanced command post, quickly moved to where the path had been cleared through the minefield and climbed to the top of the bluff. We moved inland some distance to the edge of a field where there was a clump of trees. Here we established our temporary command post. My job was to stay there, make contact with our units, find out who was and was not around, and keep track of our situation. Fred survived the D-Day invasion and many other battles. He was in the thick of it until the end of the war in Europe in 1945. His decorations included two silver stars, three bronze stars, unit decorations, and many service medals. He served on active duty during the Korean conflict. He retired in 1966 with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. This ends the podcast. If you have any questions or comments, please email bobgriffinpodcast at gmail.com. And come back next month for another episode of Rochester, New Hampshire History.